showin' off. Jimmy Trescott's new velocipede had the largest front wheel of any velocipede in Willemville. When it first arrived from New York, he wished to sacrifice school, food, and sleep to it. Evidently, he wished to become a sort of perpetual velocipede rider. But the powers of the family laid a number of judicious embargoes upon him, and he was prevented from becoming a fanatic. Of course, this caused him to retain a fondness for the three-wheeled thing much longer than if he had been allowed to debauch himself for a span of days. But in the end, it was an immaterial machine to him. For long periods, he left it idle in the stable. One day, he loitered from school towards home by a very circuitous route. He was accompanied by only one of his retainers. The object of this detour was the wooing of a little girl in a red hood. He had been in love with her for some three weeks. His desk was near her desk in school, but he had never spoken to her. He had been afraid to take such a radical step. It was not customary to speak to girls. Even boys who had school-going sisters seldom addressed them during that part of a day which was devoted to education. The reasons for this conduct were very plain. First, the more robust boys considered talking with girls an unmanly occupation. Second, the greater part of the boys were afraid. Third, they had no idea of what to say, because they esteemed the proper sentences should be supernaturally incisive and eloquent. In consequence, a small contingent of blue-eyed weaklings were the sole intimates of the frail sex, and for it they were boisterously and disdainfully called girl-boys. But this situation did not prevent serious and ardent wooing. For instance, Jimmy and the little girl who wore the red hood must have exchanged glances at least two hundred times in every school hour, and this exchange of glances accomplished everything. In them the two children renewed their curious, inarticulate vows. Jimmy had developed a devotion to school which was the admiration of his father and mother. In the mornings he was so impatient to have it made known to him that no misfortune had befallen his romance during the night that he was actually detected at times feverishly listening for the first bell. Dr. Trescott was exceedingly complacent of the change, and as for Mrs. Trescott, she had ecstatic visions of a white-haired Jimmy leading the nations in knowledge comprehending all from bugs to comets. It was merely the doing of the little girl in the red hood. When Jimmy made up his mind to follow his sweetheart home from school, the project seemed such an arbitrary and shameless innovation that he hastily lied to himself about it. No, he was not following Abby. He was merely making his way homeward through the new and rather longer route of Bryant Street and Oakland Park. It had nothing at all to do with a girl. It was a mere eccentric notion. Come on, said Jimmy gruffly to his retainer. Let's go on this way. What fur? demanded the retainer. Oh, because. Huh? Oh, uh, it's more fun going this way. The retainer was bored and loath, but that mattered very little. He did not know how to disobey his chief. Together they followed the trail of red-hooded Abby and another small girl. These latter at once understood the object of the chase, and, looking back giggling, they pretended to quicken their pace. But they were always looking back. Jimmy now began his courtship in earnest. The first thing to do was to prove his strength in battle. This was transacted by means of the retainer. He took that devoted boy and flung him heavily to the ground. "'meanwhile mouthing a preposterous ferocity. "'The retainer accepted this behaviour "'with a sort of bland resignation. "'After his overthrow he raised himself, "'coolly brushed some dust and dead leaves from his clothes, "'and then seemed to forget the incident. "'I can jump further than you can,' said Jimmy in a loud voice. "'I know it,' responded the retainer simply. "'But this would not do. "'There must be a contest.' "'Come on!' shouted Jimmy imperiously. "'Let's see you jump!' The retainer selected a footing on the curb, balanced and calculated a moment, and jumped without enthusiasm. Jimmy's leap, of course, was longer. "'There!' 
he cried, blowing out his lips. I beat you, didn't I? Easy, I beat you. He made a great hubbub, as if the affair was unprecedented. Yes, admitted the other, emotionless. Later, Jimmy forced his retainer to run a race with him, held more jumping matches, flung him twice to earth, and generally behaved as if a retainer were indestructible. If the retainer had been in the plot, it is conceivable that he would have endured the treatment with mere whispered, half-laughing protests, but he was not in the plot at all, and so he became enigmatic. One cannot often sound the profound well in which lie the meanings of boyhood. Following the two little girls, Jimmy eventually passed into that suburb of Willemville which is called Oakland Park. At his heels came a badly battered retainer, Oakland Park was a somewhat strange country to the boys. They were dubious of the manners and customs, and of course they would have to meet the local chieftains, who might look askance upon this invasion. Jimmy's girl departed into her home with a last backward glance that almost blinded the thrilling boy. On this pretext, and that pretext, he kept his retainer in play before the house. He had hopes that she would emerge as soon as she had deposited her school bag. A boy came along the walk. Jimmy knew him at school. He was Tommy Semple, one of the weaklings who made friends with the fair sex. "'Hello, Tom,' said Jimmy. "'You live around here?' "'Yeah,' said Tom, with composed pride. At school he was afraid of Jimmy, but he did not evince any of this fear as he strolled well inside his own frontiers. Jimmy and his retainer had not expected this boy to display the manners of a minor chief, and they contemplated him attentively. There was a silence. Finally, Jimmy said, "'I can put you down,' he moved forward briskly. "'Can't I?' he demanded. The challenged boy backed away. "'I know you can,' he declared frankly and promptly. The little girl in the red hood had come out with a hoop. She looked at Jimmy with an air of insolent surprise in the fact that he still existed and began to trundle her hoop off towards some other little girls who were shrilly playing near a nursemaid and a perambulator. Jimmy adroitly shifted his position until he too was playing near the perambulator, pretentiously making mincemeat out of his retainer and Tommy Semple. Of course, little Abby had defined the meaning of Jimmy's appearance in Oakland Park. Despite this nonchalance and grand air of accident, nothing could have been more plain whereupon she, of course, became insufferably vain in manner, and whenever Jimmy came near her she tossed her head and turned away her face and daintily swished her skirts as if he were contagion itself. But Jimmy was happy. His soul was satisfied with the mere presence of the beloved object, so long as he could feel that she furtively gazed upon him from time to time and noted his extraordinary prowess which he was proving upon the persons of his retainer and Tommy Semple. And he was making an impression. There could be no doubt of it. He had many times caught her eye fixed admiringly upon him as he mauled the retainer. Indeed, all the little girls gave attention to his deeds, and he was the hero of the hour. Presently, a boy on a velocipede was seen to be tooling down towards them. "'Who's this coming?' said Jimmy bluntly to the simple boy. "'That's Horace Glenn,' said Tommy. "'And he's got a new velocipede, and he can ride it like anything.' "'Can you lick him?' asked Jimmy. "'I don't—I never fought with him,' answered the other. He bravely tried to appear as a man of respectable achievement, but with Horace coming towards them— the risk was too great. However, he added, Maybe I could. The advent of Horace on his new velocipede created a sensation which he haughtily accepted as a familiar thing. Only Jimmy and his retainer remained silent and impassive. Horace eyed the two invaders. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Horace. After the typical silence, Jimmy said pompously, I got a velocipede. "'Have you?' asked Horace anxiously. He did not wish anybody in the world but himself to possess a velocipede. "'Yes,' sang Jimmy, "'and it's a bigger one than that, too. A good deal bigger, 
and it's a better one, too. Huh, retorted Horace skeptically. Ain't I, Clarence? Ain't I? Ain't I got one bigger than that? The retainer answered with alacrity. Yes, he has, a good deal bigger, and it's a dindy, too. This corroboration rather disconcerted Horace, but he continued to scoff at any statement that Jimmy also owned a velocipede. As for the contention that this supposed velocipede could be larger than his own, he simply wouldn't hear of it. Jimmy had been a very gallant figure before the coming of Horace, but the new velocipede had relegated him to a squalid secondary position, so he affected to look with contempt upon it. Voluminously he bragged of the velocipede in the stable at home, he painted its virtues and beauty in loud and extravagant words, flaming words, and the retainer stood by, glibly endorsing everything. The little company heeded him, and he passed on vociferously from extravagance to utter impossibility. Horace was very sick of it. His defense was reduced to a mere mechanical grumbling. "'Don't believe you got one tall! Don't believe you got one tall!' Jimmy turned upon him suddenly. "'How fast can you go? How fast can you go?' he demanded. "'Let's see. I bet you can't go fast.' Horace lifted his spirits and answered with proper defiance. "'Can't I?' he mocked. "'Can't I?' "'No, you can't,' said Jimmy. "'You can't go fast.' Horace cried. "'Well, you see me now. I'll show you. I'll show you if I can't go fast.' Taking a firm seat on his vermilion machine, he pedaled furiously up the walk, turned, and pedaled back again. "'There now!' he shouted triumphantly. "'Ain't that fast! There now!' There was a low murmur of appreciation from the little girls. Jimmy saw with pain that even his divinity was smiling upon his rival. "'There! Ain't that fast! Ain't that fast!' He strove to pin Jimmy down to an admission. He was exuberant with victory. Notwithstanding a feeling of discomfiture, Jimmy did not lose a moment of time. Why, he yelled, that ain't going fast tall. That ain't going fast tall. Why, I can go almost twice as fast as that. Almost twice as fast, can't I, Clarence? The royal retainer nodded solemnly at the wide-eyed group. Course you can. Why, spouted Jimmy, you just ought to see me ride once. You just ought to see me. Why, I can go like the wind, can't I, Clarence? And I can ride far, too. Oh, awful far, can't I, Clarence? Why, I wouldn't have that one. Tain't any good. You just ought to see mine once. The overwhelmed Horace attempted to reconstruct his battered glories. I can ride right over the curbstone at some of the crossings, he announced brightly. Jimmy's derision was a splendid sight. Right over the curbstone. Why, that wouldn't be nothing for me to do. I rode mine down Bridge Street Hill. Yes, sir, ain't I, Clarence? Why, it ain't nothing to ride over a curbstone. Not for me, is it, Clarence? Down Bridge Street Hill? You never, said Horace hopelessly. Well, didn't I, Clarence? Didn't I now? The faithful retainer again nodded solemnly at the assemblage. At last, Horace, having fallen as low as was possible, began to display a spirit for climbing up again. "'Oh, you can do wonders,' he said, laughing. "'You can do wonders. I suppose you could ride down that bank there,' he asked with art. He had indicated a grassy terrace some six feet in height, which bounded one side of the walk. At the bottom was a small ravine in which the reckless had flung ashes and tins. "'I suppose you could ride down the bank?' All eyes were now turned upon Jimmy to detect a sign of his weakening, but he instantly and sublimely arose to the occasion. "'That bank?' he asked scornfully. "'Why, I've ridden down banks like that many a time, ain't I, Clarence?' This was too much for the company. A sound like the wind in the leaves arose. It was the song of incredulity and ridicule. Oh! And on the outskirts, a little girl suddenly shrieked out, Storyteller! Horace had certainly won a skirmish. He was gleeful. 
Oh, you can do wonders, he gurgled. You can do wonders. The neighborhood's superficial hostility to foreigners arose like magic under the influence of his sudden success, and Horace had the delight of seeing Jimmy persecuted in that manner known only to children and insects. Jimmy called angrily to the boy on the velocipede. If you'll lend me yours, I'll show you whether I can or not. Horace turned his superior nose in the air. Oh, no, I don't ever lend it. Then he thought of a blow which would make Jimmy's humiliation complete. Besides, he said airily, tain't really anything hard to do. I could do it easy if I wanted to. But his supposed adherence, instead of receiving this boast with cheers, looked upon him in a sudden blank silence. Jimmy and his retainer pounced like cats upon their advantage. Oh, they yelled, you could, eh? Well, let's see you do it then. Let's see you do it. Let's see you do it now. In a moment, the crew of little spectators were jibing at Horace. The blow that would make Jimmy's humiliation complete. Instead, it had boomeranged Horace into the mud. He kept up a sullen muttering, "'Tain't really anything. I could if I wanted to.' "'Dare you to!' screeched Jimmy and his partisans. "'Dare you to! Dare you to! Dare you to!' There were two things to be done, to make gallant effort or to retreat. Somewhat to their amazement, the children at last found Horace moving through their clamour to the edge of the bank. Sitting on the velocipede, he looked at the ravine, and then, with gloomy pride, at the other children. A hush came upon them, for it was seen that he was intending to make some kind of an anti-mortem statement. I, he began. Then he vanished from the edge of the walk. The start had been unintentional, an accident. The stupefied Jimmy saw the calamity through a haze. His first clear vision was when Horace, with a face as red as a red flag, a rose bawling from his tangled velocipede. He and his retainer exchanged a glance of horror and fled the neighborhood. They did not look back until they had reached the top of the hill near the lake. They could see Horace walking slowly under the maples towards his home, pushing his shattered velocipede before him. His chin was thrown high, and the breeze bore them the sound of his howls. End of Showing Off